We spend both time and money to collect the sun's energy, but can we reproduce that energy? Smack dab in the geometric core of our closest star, some 700,000 kilometers beneath the surface of the sun, the most powerful source of energy we know operates around the clock and provides our planet with light and heat. The way the sun actually works was a mystery up until 1938. Albrecht Bethe and Charles Critchfield, both specialists in atomic physics, speculated that stars produced their energy by means of nuclear fusion. That meant hydrogen atoms fusing to produce helium and powerful radiation as a byproduct, the same radiation that bathes Earth in light and heat, the same radiation that illuminates the Milky Way. Astronomers estimate that the Sun's core is subject to pressure approximately 225,000 times greater than that exerted by our atmosphere on the surface of the Earth. On the Sun, temperatures reach 15 million degrees centigrade. The combination of such tremendous heat and pressure is what causes nuclear fusion. Every second, 580 million tons of hydrogen are transformed into helium. Fusion is uh, the uh, reaction which is the opposite to uh, fission. Uh, I think people are familiar with fission. Fission is uh, the reaction where very heavy nuclei are breaking to produce uh, more stable, smaller nuclei and this is releasing a lot of energy. Uh, on the very other end, that is when you bring together uh, very light nuclei, they can fuse, and when they fuse, they produce other nuclei, heavier but more stable, and thereby they release a lot of energy. And this is a reaction which is uh, more or less the basic reaction in the universe in which we are, because uh, it's a reaction you find in the stars, and the stars uh, draw their energy, which compensates uh, the, the gravity which would bring the stars to collapse. The, the, the stars bring, take their energy from fusion reactions, and there is in stars a balance between the fusion energy and the gravity, and this makes us, the stars exist, and that we, we exist also ourselves. Imitating the process used by stars to produce energy is one of science's oldest dreams. Hydrogen nuclei carry a positive charge, and according to the laws of physics, two positively charged particles won't bond. To overcome such strong electrostatic force, these nuclei must be compressed and heated at temperatures of up to 100 million degrees centigrade. But there's no place on Earth where such conditions exist, and to produce them is no easy feat. Nuclear fusion has been achieved on Earth, but without sufficient control. It was used to produce the H-bomb in 1952. To obtain such extreme temperatures, its designers used nuclear fission. Regardless of the military objectives at stake, this experiment constituted the first key step in achieving fusion. But how could the process be reproduced and controlled? Given the extreme conditions required, fusion calls for fuel to be tightly contained. Hydrogen must be heated to split up its atomic structure. Its electrons and nuclei break up and form a kind of chaotic soup called plasma. Then it must be heated further and compressed so densely that it reaches temperatures of between 100 and 200 million degrees centigrade and the requisite density for more than a second. Under those conditions, nothing can maintain its initial solid structure. Reactions such as this must take place literally in the air. This curious nuclear levitation can be obtained with lasers and also with magnetic fields. In order to produce nuclear fusion, we have designed sophisticated machines, small Earth-based suns that allow us to imitate the star's light and heat-generating processes. 
The most advanced device up until now is the tokamak, a magnetic confining device developed in the former Soviet Union midway through the 20th century. When European industry took an interest in nuclear fusion, the Joint European Taurus Project, better known as JET, was established. The experiments carried out in these devices have shown great promise right from the start. In fact, the appropriate conditions for nuclear fusion have been achieved, but separately. The different efforts have never joined forces. The JET project, for example, managed to fuse hydrogen nuclei, but in a very inefficient way, spending more energy than was produced. The next step is a new machine called ITER. It's being built jointly by the United States, Europe, Russia, and Japan. The ITER is considered the most avant-garde scientific endeavor after the space station. Right now, we foresee that by the year 2020, mankind will have the technological skill to produce fusion that can generate great amounts of energy at a relatively low cost, or rather with minimal energy input. That's to say that the, the factor of multiplication of that energy will be such that with only this small amount of fuel, this small amount that we're going to introduce, we'll be able to get from the water, which we are going to heat to 100 million degrees, will produce around 500 million watts of thermal energy that we can then use to produce electrical power. We want to light up the darkness, to be warm in winter, and to have air conditioning in summer. We want our cars, trains, and airplanes. We want to have our factories working at full capacity. But at the same time, we need to keep our atmosphere free of the negative effects generated in the pursuit of our dreams. Energy is what marks man's growth and the progress of civilization. It's the motor that drives expansion, and it's also the key to environmental equilibrium. Energy is the main factor of inequality between social strata, the problem and the solution. It's the future, for better or worse. The answer may still lie deep in the heart of far-off suns, but little by little, it appears that mankind is steadily closing in on the secrets of the universe. <laughs>